Well, we have one more very special guest of the morning session. And to introduce that special guest, I have a special guest. And um, I'm delighted to have with us this morning the President of the United States Institute of Peace, Richard Solomon. Good morning. I suspect that uh, you early on heard that uh, we're, we're delighted to be able to welcome you here in our new home. We've been here in the uh, new institute building for just about a month, and uh, we're still tweaking the sound systems and otherwise uh, getting the place working right, but uh, what shall I say? Uh, to have held this event in the cramped quarters of the National Restaurant Association building, which is where we were for many years, uh, would have not highlighted the significance of this and, of course, much of the other work that the Institute uh, carries on. So we're very pleased uh, that we could convene you all here today. And we're also uh, very indebted, I mean, as uh, Tara indicated, I'm here as a guest. Uh, we are very uh, pleased that uh, under her leadership and that of uh, Kathleen Keenest, who uh, oversees our gender and peace building effort that uh, we've been able to, I think, play a significant role in highlighting uh, this, this very important issue. And uh, to add to the morning's discussion, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Don Steinberg, who is a, uh, a member of our family, uh, apart from uh, his current position as uh, Deputy Administrator of uh, USAID. Uh, Don was a uh, JR Fellow here at the Institute uh, and did uh, some important work looking at uh, the, the challenge of dealing with uh, internally displaced uh, persons. He has uh, a very rich experience in uh, public affairs that have uh, well prepared him for the advocacy role, the leadership role that he has played on, uh, on many gender issues. He was ambassador uh, to Angola and I think became very well aware of on the ground challenges of uh, the role of women in trying to stabilize a country that had been ripped apart by, by civil war. Uh, he was a deputy president of the International Crisis Group, again exposing him to uh, all the turmoil uh, that's going on in the world and the challenges of political stabilization. Uh, through the Uni United Nations in particular, uh, he was involved in a civil society group on women, peace and security. He was on the board of the Women's Refugee Commission and the adv an advisor to the UN Development Fund uh, for, for Women. And as uh, I think you know, for those of you who have a copy of the Women in War book that uh, we've just published, uh, he was the author of the final chapter, uh, which develops an agenda for action uh, to try to realize the goals of uh, Resolution 1325. So I don't see Don. I suspect he's out there somewhere. <laughs> or is he going to be on the screen again? Right oh, Don, you're hiding there. Please come on up in the... Uh, the podium is yours. You lost your lavalier. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really do feel a debt of gratitude to this wonderful institution. I left the State Department after some 30 years uh, in 2004 and moved directly to a fellowship program where I spent much of the year studying and living in IDP camps around the world in, uh, and in particular Sudan and Sri Lanka and uh, Colombia and Kosovo and I can't imagine an institution that would have allowed me that privilege uh, except the U.S. Institute of Peace and under uh, Dick's leadership, it has gone from strength to strength, and this is the symbol of the commitment of the United States, not only to the U.S. Institute of Peace, but to peace itself. It's an honor to be here today uh, for the launch of this, uh, this book. Uh, I wanted, indeed, to begin by thanking Kathleen and Chantal and Helga for their stewardship of not only this program, but the book itself 
and to USIP, PRIO, and the Norwegian Embassy for their support for this process. This event couldn't be happening at a more timely uh, moment. For those of us who have spent uh, literally decades working on issues of women's empowerment and protection in the context of armed conflict, these are heady times. There's a growing awareness, not only of the personal costs that women pay for uh, their exclusion, their abuse during periods of armed conflict, but also of the costs that we pay as an international community for our failing to achieve the goals of building peace, pursuing development and reconstruction post-conflict settings. I think it's truly tragic that it's taken pictures of girls having acid thrown in their face in Afghanistan for daring to return to school, or pictures of women being raped and subsequently uh, treated uh, in the Eastern Congo by a wide variety of different forces. But it is true that this has pricked the international conscience and the world is responding. At the United Nations, I think it's best symbolized by the creation of UN Women, as well as UN Action Against Sexual Violence and Conflict, the creation of a special representative for eliminating violence against women, and a plethora of UN Security Council resolutions, not just 1325, but 1820, 1887, 1888, and so on. Within our own government, indeed, I think the milestone came, as Milan was referring to, when the Secretary of State went to the United Nations last October and declared that the United States is going to prepare our own national action plan to accelerate our efforts in all of these fields. And I would stress to you that that process is being taken very seriously, not only by Milan, not only by the White House, where Samantha Power is directing the exercise, but by a wide variety of US government agencies. And this is where its real value comes. I've often said that what's in a national action plan isn't as important as the process of putting one together. And as I go over to the Defense Department and go over to our Justice Department, and even go over to our health and human services departments and talk to them about what their commitments are going to be under the National Action Plan, it is clear that there's an excitement that's building. And I'm very excited in particular about what our Defense Department will be committing to in the uh, announcement of our new National Action Plan, uh, which we hope and we have committed to and the Secretary has committed to uh, announce on the uh, 11th anniversary of 1325 to take place in October. And we have also committed to make this an inclusive process where we not only include recommendations and advice from our own civil society activists, but perhaps more importantly from the women themselves who are affected by violence, who are looking forward to participating in peace processes women like Binta Diop, the head of the Femme African Solidarité. I was delighted to see that Binta was recognized as one of the 100 uh, most influential people in the world in the latest Time Magazine uh, article. And we are working with her as well as others on the ground to make sure that their views are fully incorporated. As Binta has often said, nothing about us without us. For me, these issues are, are indeed deeply personal. Uh, I've often told the story about my experience in Afghanistan. It's in the book as well. But essentially, I was sent out to implement a peace agreement that we all call gender neutral. And it took me not so long on the ground to realize that an agreement that calls itself gender neutral is by definition discriminatory against women. We didn't have a single woman at the peace table. Uh, there were 40 men uh, who sat around and discussed issues that really needed the other 50% of the population and including those with particular ground truths to be contributing to. The closest thing we had to a woman at the table was the Russian ambassador's interpreter. 
and she would raise her eyebrows every now and again when these men would be discussing these issues that even she could realize we were getting wrong. More importantly, we, because of that absence, did not address a whole set of issues that were most important to people on the ground, issues like reproductive health care, issues like girls' education, issues like domestic violence. We didn't have an accountability mechanism for people who had committed crimes, and in particular crimes against women during the conflict. In fact, we had 13 separate amnesties that forgave men for anything that they had done during the conflict. It was even one uh, amnesty that forgave you for anything you might do six months into the future. And what that meant was that men with guns were forgiving other men with guns for crimes committed against women. We didn't have adequate uh, facilities for women in IDP camps and refugee settings, and so every time they went to use the latrine, they were literally risking their lives. Anytime they would go out to get firewood, they would be risking their lives. We didn't have adequate demobilization benefits for the women uh, who had fought in the battles. Uh, and I guess in particular, we made a very clear statement through our actions that this process was designed for the men with the guns. It wasn't designed for the people of Angola, and it wasn't designed certainly for women. We recognize these problems. It's pretty obvious when you're on the ground uh, that you're losing uh, a peace process, as Milan was referring to, about half of them do go bad. And so we did alter our programs, and we brought out gender advisors, and we put in place demobilization packages for women, and we re-looked at the structure of our IDP and refugee camps to have separate latrines and to have guards go out with women as they collected firewood. We put together livelihoods programs for girls. We put together uh, girls' education programs, et cetera. And indeed, when the process started to falter, when the political uh, elements of the, of the process and the military elements started to slow down, it was important to be able to call on civil society to, to help us in this effort to keep the men committed to the process. This all was five years before 1325. And the lessons that we learned from that experience, as well as the lessons we learned elsewhere, were incorporated into 1325. But I think we all have to recognize that 1325, as a resolution, was adopted in a different era. It was adopted in an era where the UN Security Council and even the rest of the world was uncomfortable going into internal developments within countries, especially in thematic issues. And therefore, the whole resolution is written with, we urge people, we encourage, we stress the need, as opposed to we demand, we order, we call on. Uh, and because of that, it has, in fact, achieved less than we would have hoped. The resolution itself also has suffered because of a lack of clear accountability mechanisms. It has suffered because of a lack of measurable uh, criteria. It has suffered because we don't have a single entity that owns this, uh, this resolution. All of that said, with the announcement by the Secretary of the development of a new national action plan, we at AID, uh, for one, have taken this agenda very, very seriously. And I wanted to focus on a variety of things that we are doing both in the women and armed conflict area, but in the broader area. And we are, uh, in that context, focused on what we call a five-pillar approach. To begin with, we're focused on women's empowerment, women's economic, political, and social empowerment. This means support for political caucuses. It means support for safe schools for girls. It means reproductive health care systems. It means building women's civil society groups. 
It means engaging women not just in microenterprise, which they often are shunted into, but in small and medium and large size enterprises as well. It means all of these programs have to be taken to scale as well. It's not just a question of 200 safe schools in Liberia. It's a question of 200,000 safe schools throughout Africa. In that regard, as I said before, our efforts at empowerment are drawing on the wisdom of the women who are actually affected by this program. We are involving them as planners, as implementers, and as beneficiaries. Secondly, we have committed ourselves to full gender integration into all of our large initiatives. What this means is that as we proceed with programs in food security, global health, climate change, we recognize that women are key to the success in these areas. And so, in the food security program that we are now running, Feed the Future, we have five full-time people just focused on gender considerations. In our global health program, we have three people who are doing this full-time. In Afghanistan, we have five full-time people focused on gender issues. There's a recognition throughout our agency that this isn't in some sense a uh, outside or a pet issue that is to be addressed once we've achieved other objectives. It is part and parcel of the success of any initiative that we're taking. The third area is a commitment to uh, include gender considerations in the policy debates. Too frequently at the principals committee meetings and the deputies committee meetings and all of the other meetings that take place in Washington, there isn't a voice for gender considerations. And so it falls to, frankly, Milan Vivier's office as well as USAID to be saying, hey, we're going to be putting together a program for Egypt here. Where are the women? when we look at Libya, when we look at what we're going to be doing in the Eastern Congo, when we're looking at Afghanistan, it is important to have the voice of Secretary Clinton saying, we will not sacrifice women's rights on the altar of peace in that country, as she has said. And so what we are saying to all of our participants in the interagency process is, if no one else raises it, you raise it. Fourth, we need to walk the walk in-house. We need to look at the role of women within USAID itself. I think we do fairly well here, but every agency has to be on the guard. Are we being fair in our recruitment policies? Are we, as we bring women and men on board, are we treating them equally but also responding to their individual needs? Are we mentoring? Do we have performance evaluations that reflect uh, uh, a commitment to gender equality? Are we looking at our promotion processes and assignment processes to make sure that we're walking the walk in-house? And finally is the whole area we're talking about today, which is participation and protection of women in conflict and emergency periods. Yes, it's about the whole 1325 agenda, but it's also about trafficking in women and girls. It's about pr addressing uh, sexual and gender-based violence in conflict and food security and uh, other emergency situations. It's about collaborating with UN women. It's about making sure that peacekeepers, when they move to the ground, are doing uh, what they should in the gender dimension. And in this area, I wanted to highlight just a few of the programs that were uh, adopting at USAID, because it's not just about structures, it's really about changing norms and about instituting programs. So we have indeed, as Milan referred to, laid the groundwork for all of our work in this area in the QDDR that was published in December. If you go through that document, women are on every page of that document. We've, as I've said, contributed to a national action plan. We have strengthened our criteria to require every single proposal for a project to NAID to have a gender impact statement. 
with time-bound goals and with accountability mechanisms and metrics. We have expanded our mandatory gender awareness programs for all of our officers. I do an hour-long program with all of our junior officers coming in as part of a day-long program that we do on gender issues. Last month, we instituted a tough new code of conduct for all AID employees and our development partners with respect to trafficking in persons. I also had the pleasure in Afad University a couple of weeks ago, that great institution of, of women's university in Khartoum. Uh, I don't know how many people have been there, but you walk around that campus in the middle of a Islamic and very male-oriented society and you feel like you're at Radcliffe or Wellesley or the UCLA, actually. Uh, but a fabulous institution, and I've had the, the privilege of addressing people at that institution a number of times, and this time I got to announce that USAID has put together a $14 million program where we are supporting women's participation in peace processes around the world. We're providing them not only stipends to take care of their families when they're gone, but travel resources, we're going to be providing them training to participate in peace processes, and we're even going to be addressing the issue of security for them, because we all know that one of the worst, uh, most dangerous professions in the world is a woman peace builder. These programs are available around the world. We have uh, now gotten an amazing response to the, the proposals. And I'm very excited that if we, as an international community, can open the door of these peace agreements to women's participation, that they will now be able to sit at the table and uh, have the capacity to, uh, to contribute most significantly. The final thing we've done at USAID, and this is probably the thing I'm most excited about, is to assemble what I think is a dream, dream team of senior officials. Uh, I am absolutely delighted uh, that our, we now have a senior coordinator for gender equality and women's empowerment, Carla Coppell, who will be talking to you later, coming from the Institute uh, for Inclusive Security. She's been on the job for two weeks, and she's already made a major impact on our institution. At the same time, we brought in a senior advisor for gender integration to make sure that indeed gender is fully integrated in all of our presidential initiatives. And in that regard, I'm equally delighted that we've been able to bring in Karen Grohn, who is from American University and in fact one of the most superb gender economists that I've ever met. And we've also brought in a watchdog for full incorporation of gender into our democracy, governance, and human rights programs and uh, Sarah Mendelson from CSIS is filling that role equally successfully. So I think we're on the right road. I think we've made some progress, but I wanted to conclude by telling you the two things that keep me up at night. The first is a concern that all that we're doing isn't really touching the lives of women in, on the ground. I want to know that we have indeed prevented at least one woman from being raped in Eastern Congo or prevented one girl from having acid thrown in her face in Afghanistan for daring to return to school. This is a reminder always that we can do whatever we want in Washington or even at our field missions, but unless we're touching the lives of individuals, it doesn't really matter. Uh, thank you for your remarks and for being here. My question is about um, changing the institutions and norms, which you mentioned. And I was wondering if you had any information or perhaps successful approaches or could comment generally on how to change the institutions and norms so that women can be economically empowered, which will ultimately lead to more peaceful societies. Thank you. One yep. one. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question, but it's actually one that I'm, I'm more encouraged about than the actual implementation of programs on the ground, as I was suggesting. 
you cannot have a UN Security Council resolution right now on peacekeeping, for example, that doesn't include language on 1325, on civilian protection, on the need for peacekeepers to be out there preventing sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, you cannot have a major uh, peace agreement that is silent on these issues anymore. Uh, and if you look at the history, uh, we have had a situation where most of the major agreements in the past have just not even talked about these issues, and that's not occurring anymore. You can't have a situation in Afghanistan, for example, where the government or civil society can ignore women, where they can, as I've suggested, sacrifice w women's rights on the altar of a peace process. That simply cannot occur right now. So I think in the norms area, we're doing pretty well. I think in the institution area, we're doing equally well. We have so many organizations now out there, uh, whether it's civil society groups or advocacy groups or government institutions, and certainly on the, in the United Nations, whether it's uh, the work that uh, Michelle Bachelet is doing at UN Women, Margaret Wallstrom as the representative for uh, sexual violence, a whole variety of others. The problem for me is taking those norms and those institutions and translating them into action. And I would, I would say, I mean, one area that I've done a lot of work on is protecting women in the context of displacement. And this stemmed in large part from my work at USIP. But in 2005, the Interagency Steering Committee for the United Nations prepared some of the most fabulous guidance that you could ever imagine on how to make sure that women are safe in the process of having been driven from their homes and in refugee or IDP camps around the world. And I keep hearing people say, hey, we need guidance, we need norms, we need institutions. Well, it's all there. The problem is we're not doing it. You know, you go down to Haiti, and we all knew that there was going to be a problem with sexual violence in the wake of the earthquake, and yet 24 out of 26 IDP camps that we set up as an international community did not have differentiated men's and women's latrines. That's an invitation we know to sexual violence and rape. And yet we s convinced ourselves, I, I believe, that, hey, we got to get down there, we got to set up these camps, we'll worry about these sort of women's issues or gender issues later. And that's a prescription for disaster. That's a prescription not only for sexual abuse and rape, but it's a, a prescription for failure of the process itself. And again, I point back to Milan's uh, reference to 50% of our peace agreements failing. I would also add that this is the reason that we frequently use the efficacy or efficiency argument on these issues as opposed to the human rights arguments or the fairness or the equity arguments. Because if you go to the men who negotiate these peace agreements, and please remember we still have never had a UN-led negotiation that was led by a woman. If you go to the men, and you start talking fairness and equity and oh, 50% of the population and oh, they've suffered so much. If you use the victimhood card, it doesn't work. If you say to them, your personal reputation as well as the credibility of this whole process is threatened by your ignoring women in the process, sometimes you get through. Um, let me go to Ginny. I think I see Ginny in the back. Thank you. Welcome back, Don. It's a Thank delight you. to have you here and to um, see your leadership within AID from afar on these issues. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, was there a moment when the gender issue clicked for you? How, how did it happen? Um, and secondly, where do you see resistance to people understanding the gender dimensions of conflict and security and peace? And finally, what can we be doing, or what should we be doing to get more men in the room for the conversation? Thanks. For, for any person, man or woman, involved in 
these issues as a major part. Yes, there is usually a, an aha moment, that moment where you finally sort of get it. I would say I was, I was pretty much primed for that because when I was 16 years old, my mother bought me a lifetime membership in the National Organization for Women. Uh, <laughs> that so would do it. That, that, would that, do it. that was a help. <laughs> Uh, I would also say I was really influenced when I graduated from college, uh, Shirley Chisholm came to speak to our graduation, and she said and articulated in great detail the fact that she had experienced much more prejudice in her life for being a woman than she did for being black. And so that, you know, the variety of issues sort of primed me for it, but I will say that it probably happened in in the Central African Republic. I was uh, 22 years old, a junior officer in the Foreign Service, and sent out to uh, the province of Guam to put together a rural health program. And I was basically, I, why they entrusted me with $2 million, I will never know, but they did. And we went out and we talked with all of the men who we were instructed to talk to by the government, all the mayors and the governors and civil uh, city council people, and we could get nothing done. They were more concerned about who had the power, who got the money, and then after having done that for literally weeks, we started to meet with women's groups. Uh, and frankly, we started to assemble women's groups since there weren't that many uh, institutions out there. And they would come and they would tell us exactly what we needed to do. They told us you need to focus on immunization. They said you need to focus on water and sanitation and you need to focus on maternal and child health care. And they said the single most dangerous thing to be in our society is a pregnant woman. Uh, is a pregnant woman. Uh, and so we did. And we went back to the men and we, and, we, and we claimed that from our discussions with the men, we had discovered <laughs> that these were the things that they were advocating. And we spent two years implementing that program. When I left, you could already see declines in infant mortality, declines in maternal mortality. You could see people thriving because of our programs. And what that said to me is not only that you can make a difference, but that if you're listening to people on the ground, and in particular if you're listening to women who have ground truth, who really know what's important for human security as opposed to some broad concept of national security, that's when you get the jobs done. So I would, I would basically say that that was it. Obviously, there have been a lot of reinforcing elements throughout my career. My experience in South Africa watching ANC women, I was there during the uh, movement from apartheid to non-racial democracy, watching the ANC women step forward and play the role that they were supposed to be playing. My experience in Angola obviously was influential as well. Um, again, if you're talking about how to get more men involved in this exercise. I, I just go back to my previous comment. You cannot use it as a, oh, be nice to women. You also cannot use the victimhood card. It is pernicious. Uh, women aren't victims. They are s s survivors and they are the key to rebuilding strong, stable societies. And as soon as you put a label of victimhood it's, it's done. And then you get men adopting paternalistic attitudes where they think they know better as to what uh, ought to be done in one or another situations. Now I'm going to count contradict what I just said a little bit because I also believe that it's important to have women who are trusted by those men play a role. And I describe in the book how we got UN Security Council Resolution 1820. And I'm not exaggerating that it was really, this is the resolution that uh, established the office of uh, a special advisor for addressing sexual violence and conflict. What really happened here was that the 15 wives 
of the 15 members of the Security Council all got together and said, we have to do something to influence our husbands. They got copies of some great movies, documentaries on rape in the Eastern Congo, et cetera. They forced their husbands to watch that. They forced them all to go to a conference in Ditchley in the UK just in advance of, of the resolution being considered. And yes, you know, their governments all came along. Uh, yes, there were big sociological issues at play and power politics and whatever. But the truth is, the reason we got that resolution is because of that effort. And so bringing it home to people, telling them this is your sister, this is your mother, this is your daughter, uh, can, can often work as well. Let's take um, one more question right up front. Hi there, Hi. Lyric Thompson with Women for Women International. Thank you so much for um, your commitment always and your comments today. Just wanted to ask briefly if you have had a chance to speak with your colleagues at State at All in developing the U.S. National Action Plan about the carrots and sticks that we're able to provide to um, operationalize some of these aspirations. I found um, the Secretary General's uh, seven-point action plan that was released last fall to have some um, interesting lessons learned and emphasis on how can you incentivize these parties to bring um, women to the table and change these numbers. Commitment from his office to naming a woman uh, a woman negotiator of a peace process, these sorts of things. I know legislatively we do have some provisions, at least for Afghanistan, tying aid to women's rights. Um, what are What's the thinking on how we're going to do that? No, it's a great question because it, it's one that gets to the heart of changing behavior. And let me start by saying something relatively controversial, which is I don't really care what's in the minds of the men and women who are implementing our programs overseas. I do care about their behavior. Martin Luther King once said, I can't make that white racist love me, but I can sure make him stop uh, lynching me. And so I'm more concerned about doing the incentives and doing the directions than I am about winning the hearts and minds of people. That, I think, will come. I think it's changing already. I think nor the, all of these norms are changing. You cannot have overt sexual discrimination in the workplace anymore. You just can't do it. You can be subtle about it, but you, but, and, and that's where a lot of this happens. But we have changed norms. We have changed values. So the real question is how do you change behavior? For me, there are two keys here. One is individual incentives and individual uh, punitive measures. And so it is all about putting into our performance evaluation criteria how well did you do on bringing in an inclusive development approach. And we have just restructured our evaluations for determining who gets to be a mission director in USAID, and that's the equivalent of an ambassador. So it's a really high position. And the very first item is, are you an inclusive leader? Are you drawing in you know, other agencies, the government, et cetera, but are you also reaching out to all the communities out there, including most prominently the 50% of the population who is normally excluded from the development dialogue? You also change this uh, in that same regard by individual behavior. I now go out, whenever I travel, the very first thing I say to my mission is put together a round table with women's civil society groups on the ground. Like we just did it in southern Sudan, we just did it in Khartoum, we did it in Cairo, we did it in uh, Haiti, I'm about to go to Georgia next week, we're gonna do the same thing. The message gets across to people that this isn't a pet rock, that this is part and parcel of everything you're doing. Carla Coppell now sits in our small uh, 
group meeting every morning uh, at the State Department, at USAID. Uh, and she is a constant voice and a constant reminder of the importance of these issues. But it's not just Carla. It's making sure that everyone else in the room understands the importance of these issues. I've always said it's great to have a minister of women's issues, but you want the minister of health to be thinking about these issues constantly, and you want the minister of defense to be thinking about them and all the rest. The final point is it's all about monitoring and evaluation. It's all about accountability. It's all about measurement. It's nice to put these, this language in, but I say to every program that we're doing in this area, and more broadly, I want to see four or five things. I want time-bound goals. So tell me what you're going to do, but tell me when you're going to get done with it. I want to see accountability mechanisms. Who's responsible for this? And when it screws up, who deserves the blame? And when it works well, who deserves the credit? I want measurable criteria. So it's not just a question of focusing even on the inputs or the outputs, it's the outcomes. So it's not just a question of having more women at the table, it's a question of having that process work more effectively. Very fascinating case, and I know I'm using up too much time here, but at the State Department there was a lawsuit against uh, the department for its failure to incorporate women in its all of its programs. And it was a lawsuit that lasted some, <coughs> some 15 years. And when it was ultimately decided in favor of the plaintiffs, it said, we're not just asking you to change the numbers. We're not asking you to change the rules. We're asking you to prove that the full integration of women is producing the best foreign policy for the United States that it can do. You have a constitutional requirement to produce that best foreign policy. You're blowing it by not fully utilizing half of your population. And because of that, the State Department couldn't just jigger the numbers. They couldn't just appoint a few ambassadors as women. They had to form fundamentally change the whole structure. And they're actually doing it, which is a very encouraging sign. The last thing I want to say is follow the buck. Unless we're putting money behind this stuff, it's all just words on a, on a piece of paper or words from <coughs> me talking to you at this point. In, we've got to have money behind it, and it's going to be a tough budget environment, but we have prioritized this at USAID. I know at the Defense Department, I know at State, they are prioritizing this. Hold our feet to the fire. Ask us a year from now, how much have you put into this area? Frankly, we don't know right now. And one of Carla's principal assignments is going to be to do an inventory of what we're actually spending. You know, what are we doing in health and education and housing and all of these areas to promote women's issues? Uh, so hold us accountable and follow the buck. Don, I want to thank you um, for this wonderful conversation. I know there are still hands going. Chantal will tell us what is next, and um, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to grab speakers as you can.